Taiwan, uh, where he has already uh, worked in maize weeding at a public institution comparable to USDA. And he already did work on uh, inducer development. He attended our workshop, I think two years or three years back where I got him uh, to know. And uh, at that time we were kind of deciding to work together and he was then joining my group. So with that, he will talk about his work on user development. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? We, we can hear you, but your slides look funny on our, on our screen. Oh, not on your screen? If you go to display settings, I think, and switch to, yeah, you're sharing the presenter view. You need to switch to the other type of view. To go on top. Top middle option. Settings, so. There. Oh, sorry. I'm not good at this, but uh, try it out. So, share. Mm. Say okay. Okay. Is it all right? It's good. No, it's not good. Shit. Okay. Yep. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank. Thanks for Thomas' nice introduction. N nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuru. Today, I would like to share my ongoing research of maternal haploid inducer with you. Okay. So, uh, presentation have two parts. At first, I will introduce the uh, double haploid technology in maize, and there are two protective mechanisms involved in haploid induction. And there are two major genes uh, will be corn. And uh, I will uh, briefly introduce the history of uh, public inducer line breeding and what are the benefits of DH technology for maize breeding. And the second part is to uh, share my sharing uh, my ongoing research. The idea of the C1I inducer and how to use this uh, inducer to, for uh, haploid inducer DH line development. And there is an experiment uh, deriving, uh, developing the haploid inducer with haploid genome doubling ability. And my main project is to do a genetic improvement of haploid induction rate of uh, haploid inducer by genomic prediction and the uh, hepatite shelling analysis approach. Okay, so the in vivo double haploid technology in maize uh, is widely applied in uh, modern haploid, uh, modern uh, maize uh, breeding nowadays. So um, there are four main steps uh, to produce haploid, uh, double haploid line in the field. The first step is to use uh, inducer with the dominant uh, purple color expressed by Awanavile gene causing with the uh, source uh, population to obtain the haploid from those F1 seeds. And uh, based on the phenotype uh, on the kernel, we can say that the haploid seeds. And typically, the haploid kernel would have the colorless embryo and the purple around there. Okay, so the third step is to do artificial chromosome doubling treatment on the uh, haploid plants. And then which would allow us to, uh, which would allow the haploid plant in the field have the pollen shelling. So the final step is to do selving in the plant to, in the field to have the DH line. So, 
the one of critical factor influence on the efficiency of this technology is the haploid induction rate. Uh, that is how many haploid seeds could be uh, in, induced on the seed set. And so there are two hypotheses of the mechanism involved the haploid induction. Normally, it would have the double fertilization in plants. One of the sperm cells uh, will fuse with the polar nuclei to be free and endosperm. And uh, the other one will fuse with uh, egg cell to be to an embryo. However, it may have some defects in pollen tube development or the sperm cell fusing with the egg cell. So which these two uh, single fertilization. And uh, the second hypothesis is that a layer is a selective a male chromosome immunization during the early uh, embryogenesis. So those two protective uh, reasons, these two lead, lead to a uh, haploid induction on the female parent in mace. So there are, uh, based on the QTL mapping result, there are two uh, major genes has been cloned. The first one is maternina gene, uh, which is discovered by three different independent research groups. So maternina is a, a pollen-specific gene encoding the uh, phospholipase enzyme. And there is a survey of uh, may, many different uh, haploid inducers. The result shows that this gene in all of them. So uh, the maternina carries uh, uh, four base pair insertion, so which cause a friendship to have a, a chain K protein. So this, this, this to have a two to three percent haploid induction rate. And the second gene is maize DNP, which is encoding a DUF, D U F, a membrane protein on sperm cells. So a maize DNP gene mutation result shows that increase uh, two to three times haploid induction rate in the maternina gene mutation uh, background. So you can see in this figure, the blue bar shows that when those line with, the, with these two mutant gene, their haploid induction rate on, on average is about uh, 8%. Okay, so however, the interesting thing is that uh, if the maize DMP knocked out on its own, it will have a low, uh, a very low haploid induction rate, which just below 1%. So this synergetic uh, effect on maternina and maize DMP mutation implies that there are these two distinct pathways are behind the high haploid induction rate in the modern haploid inducer lines. So about the history of uh, maternal haploid inducer breeding in maize is that the birth of uh, first haploid inducer line could be dated back to 1915s when Dr. Uh, a. Code identified a spontaneous mutant in the field which called Stock 6, uh, which is able to in induce two to 3% haploid embryo. And this genetic stock then was introduced to different country to compare to to improve their haploid induction rate by breeding. So numerous uh, derivatives are developed and leading to a, a complex pedigree among those lines. Okay, so uh, the derivative uh, with over eight percent haploid induction rate, such as uh, BHI three. UH400 and RWS are called a modern haploid inducer because they have made possible the logic, uh, large scale use of DH technology in maize breeding. And I will say uh, DH facility use SPVB line, sorry, use SPVB lines and semi use uh, tropical semi line to improve the adaptiveness of the inducer in different environments.
but also increase the haploid induction rate by marker acid selection. Okay, so nowadays, uh, almost all of the private cone breeding companies apply this technology into their breeding pipeline. So what are the benefits get from this technology? The first is it could get the complete adaptive uh, genetic variance in the first generation. Also, it can speak, speak up the breeding cycle and reduce the expenses for the selving and maintenance in the field compared with the pedigree method. Also, because it allows to do gamma, gamma genotype uh, selection, so, so that it increase the efficiency in marker assay selection or marker assay spectrosing to stack gene in the elite lines. And the least but not the least, uh, the, the last but not the least, uh, the, in, in theory, DH line is 100% pure line. So it perfect fit the dog's criteria when the cultivar releasing in public. So uh, since we are doing haploid inducer improvement, so can we get the benefits from this technology? And the question is that if it is possible uh, to obtain the inducer haploids by, indu by haploid inducers itself. Okay, because uh, normally, as I mentioned earlier, earlier uh, uh, we use the inducers uh, as female, as female, which will, which will have the R1 Navajo gene close with the donor to produce about 10% haploid seeds without a colorless embryo. However, if the donor with C1I gene, which is the repressor, repressor of R1 Navajo gene, trans, uh, not, not, not gene, R1 Navajo transcription factor. So it, it will repress the following and society structure gene expression for the purple color on the endosperm. So it doesn't allow us to select the a uh, haploid embryo from those F1 seeds, okay. However, uh, with those observation and, and so styling related gene control knowledge, the data Fred uh, Wuxia uh, in our state DH facility come up with a, a smart idea. So if uh, integrating the C1I gene into haploid uh, inducer genetic background, it could allow us to select the hap inducer haploid seeds with the purple color. Okay, so, and it is, uh, it has been demonstrated that uh, it can produce uh, inducer DH line successfully in the field in this two year experiment. So in uh, 2020 summer, uh, we had produced 510 inducer DH line in the field. And uh, in the beginning, there are uh, four, uh, there are, there are uh, <laughs> 3,700 haploid plants transplanted in the field, but there are only 22% uh, 20, haploid plants with the pollen shelling. Then the overall successful rate of DH production is just 13%. Uh, so based on this result last year, the chromosome, the artificial chromosome doubling is a critical factor on DH technology as well. Okay, so apart from haploid induction rate, the successful rate of chromosome doubling is important as well. Since if the cotrisine treatment on the haploid plant is not effective, it doesn't allow, uh, it will not have the pollen shelling in the field. So it cannot do the selfing for the DH line seeds. Okay, so uh, however, uh, fortunately uh, in our lab, there is a major QTL, spontaneous haploid genome doubling gene, SQT, S, uh, QSHGD1 has been identified on chromosome five. So if it, if Q 
QSHGD1 integrates to in inducer, it may improve the efficiency of inducer DH line production. But also it can solve a problem in high level uh, inducer development because in Henrik's research, he developed some uh, inducer lines which has uh, over 20% haploid induction rate, but also it had more haploid plants in the field, which is in introduced by land cells. So it will be a big problem when the uh, inducer haploid plant without the pollen shelling, it cannot close with the donors and do the selling for the seed increase. Okay, so, so uh, inducer with HHGD uh, gene seems like a good idea, but uh, however, uh, 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 there is a question what, uh, which is important. Are there interaction effect on haploid induction rate and the chromosome doubling abilities? Because it is because the inducer are to produce one copy of genome for the haploids. And the SHGD gene is to double the genome for the diploid. So in uh, 2019 summer, I set up an experiment causing with causing GF2 derived inducer with the SHGD uh, donor parent F1, then back inducer to be BC1 F1 population. And then use marker acid selection um, Martininia and maize DMP and SHGD alleles, then select the fixed purple color phenotype within the crops in BC1 F1 to 2 population. So there are seven families now in the winter nursery for the inducer haploid induction by C1 inducer. Then it is it's bad that uh, the inducer DH lines. Uh, what with the SHGD gene we used to construct the performance of the haploid induction rate with its recurrent parent inducers. And compare with the spontaneous haploid genome doubling ability with its donor parent GF1 doubler. Okay, so as we have the DH technology and the spontaneous genome doubling ability in our haploid inducer breeding toolbox, it could uh, benefit to get more uh, inducer DH line more efficient. But when we're thinking this in a system way, all the inducers are derived from stock six. Okay, and then the new inducers we de developed are also derived from the modern uh, haploid inducers. So the research question is that how big of the genetic improvement it can achieve is the haploid induction rate close to the plateau at 50% now in our breeding population? I haven't known yet, but the results of Henrik's research uh, give, provide me a hint. When he used PHI3 and RWS, as parents, the, their progeny shows uh, transgress, transgressive uh, segregation. So if we choose the right uh, parents in our breeding population, it may have a chance to improve haploid induction rate to higher level. So I set up two uh, new uh, breeding population in my uh, research project. Unfortunately, the owner company of PHI3 was bankrupt. So we cannot access to <laughs> this line license anymore. But we have one of PHI3 uh, parents, MHI available. So I use MHI uh, closing with RWS and SPVB derived line, derived inducers uh, to be my breeding population one. And also, the second population is used and use A founder lines, which are derived from RWS and SPVB lines, which are 
uh, have a, a 12.5 percent haploid induction rate on average, and to be a half ideal uh, design population. So those two uh, population were used as a base population for selecting the superior progeny of haploid inducer for the improvement and genomic prediction research. And the half dileo analysis result shows that the uh, general combination ability effects is significantly exists in this uh, in this uh, half dileo population. So which means that it would allow us to use adaptive genetic variation for the uh, haploid induction rate improvement. In particularly, the MO17 and PHG83, FR19, and the BHI103X derived, derived inducers have, ha, have the higher GCA estimates. Okay, so um, also in Venusius uh, research, which is published in 2020, uh, who was the visiting uh, PhD student from Brazil in our lab. He used the haploid inducer panel at ISU to predict the average performance of uh, superior progeny and their genetic variance. The result shows that they have the negative uh, correlation relationship. Also, also based on these uh, genomic prediction results, the progeny uh, with the haploid induction rate located in, in 10 to 15 percent induction rate region uh, 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 still maintain about uh, 0.08 gen predict uh, genetic variation for, for further improvement. Okay, so, think, so, so therefore <laughs> those two population go through those those two, my new population go through the DH technology pipeline. Uh, the the the, the multi-genome recombinant pure line population uh, we use to optimize the haploid induction rate performance of these selected parents. And uh, meanwhile, we we'll maintain the wider genetic uh, variance of its progeny by genomic prediction approach in my research project. Also in Henry's uh, genome-wide association study on haploid uh, induction rate, uh, he detect um, some SNP associated with haploid induction rate significantly, uh, rather than uh, the, the two major genes. So there are still other QTL contribute to haploid induction rate. Uh, so partic and, and particularly his high level inducer lines in this panel have the genetic relationship with uh, PHI3, MHI, and the RWS. So maybe using the uh, haplotype sharing, uh, sharing uh, analysis approach may be able to puzzle out the haploid uh, induction ability. Uh, for high level haploid induction rate improvement. So here, uh, having a brief sum up, the maternal haploid inducer could be in, induced by C1 inducer for inducer DH line production. And RWS and XPBB derived line, derived inducers still have some adaptive genetic variation for haploid induction rate improvement. And my and the expected outcome of my ongoing research is that uh, the haploid selection for inducer improvement and uh, solving for the embryo line development in the field by hand is so laborious. So hopefully the genomic selection and DH te technology can improve the genetic game of haploid induction ray in our breeding population more efficient and effectively and effective. And the line, the, the progeny select from MHI and RW derived uh, population 
hopefully you could have a higher genetic variation and select some uh, superior progeny over which is over 20% haploid induction rate. And it may be, it may be assessed by uh, haplotype shelling analysis. And the last but not the least is that it is it's bad that inducer with the SHGD gene not only can solve the self-induction problem, but also improve the efficiency of uh, inducer DH line development. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge the member members in Dr. Thomas Luber's Start Lab. Without their, their help, I cannot do this research on my own and improve myself neither. So I really appreciate it. Also, uh, I would be glad to answer any question from you. So that's all my presentation uh, today. Thank you. Amy, are you leading the discussion or should I? Me? Uh, so are there questions? And maybe I, I will check the chat. Um, so any questions to your rule? <laughs> I mean, I'll start with a question. With these new lines that have the improved um, um, haploid induction rate, do you think mm -hmm. they can be used for anything, or is it just really is? Are they a new line that's just used for one trait? I, I don't know a lot of. This is not my area of expertise, so I'm just curious. Uh -huh. You mean those uh, new haploid inducer can use for other purpose? Oh. No, because you use them yeah. in breeding programs, right? Uh -huh. Yes. So if you have this new um, haploid inducer that has this improved rate, mm -hmm. it, was it developed just for like one trait or now can you use it for lots of different, in lots of different breeding programs? So what would uh, be the impact if you would be able to use inducers that have double the rates of today's inducers in terms of uh, uh, DH line okay, development. So I think it, it would, when we, uh, when the induce, the hypo induction rate of inducer uh, enhance, it will have the efficiency to produce more haploid seeds after the induction. So it will uh, close down the cost when we apply this technology in the field. So we cannot, we, we, we could, uh, we, we could not uh, plan so many uh, donor, donor person, uh, gene person in the field to get, mo to get more haploids in the, in the end. So you would get some benefits for increase the haploid induction rate. So it's like uh, cost, down, <laughs> cost down for this technology if the inducer have the higher induction rate. Yeah. And I think the larger companies, they produce uh, hundred thousands or, or I don't know, millions of uh, DH lines. So it's, it's really adding up for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Iru, can you go to slides eight? I feel this is uh, one of the highlight uh, and something new to, to many of us. Uh, I couldn't uh, follow exactly. Uh, can you actually briefly summarize? Uh, I think uh, I understand number one, that's first mm -hmm. row. I mm -hmm. understand number two, that's a failure. Can you explain number three row briefly so that we understand uh, what uh, okay. we here? Okay, okay. So so idea is that uh, in normal we use uh, R1 Navajo gene to select the haploid seeds in normal uh, DH technology. But now we, we want to select the induced haploid. So uh, based, on, based on the uh, embryo color. So now we use the, when we use the C1I gene in 
uh, our induced background, inducer background. In normal, it will not, uh, in normal layer seed will have no purple color, will have the colorless uh, embryo. It's, it's normal one, but because it will have the self fertilization or the chromosome emanation. So from, from the, the, the male chromosome. So, so the haploid, the haploid embryo will show up the, the purple color in the end because it just have one of the, the genome of itself. So in, in reality, the, I, I understand the donors is a material people send to the service to make it uh, uh, hyploid. But then how do you guarantee that the donors now have all these purple genes, R1, NJ? Or maybe maybe they're just for research, not for service type. Oh yeah, it's not for service because oh. uh, this, this donor is inducer as well. This okay. donor is now inducer? Uh, 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 because we use uh, because we use the inducer as our donors to induce the haploid seed of the oh, inducers. Okay, I, I know that I cannot, but when I see the donors the inducer on the top, I, I uh -huh. my understanding the whole columns are going to be called the donors, uh -huh. and then the second column will be inducers. Now it seems yeah, yeah. that the marker gene was switched. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but it's, it's still donor, so maybe I, I can try to explain, explain in my words. So the, the problem is uh, if you want to develop uh, double taproot lines in our inducer breeding population, the R and J gene is fixed. So we can't use our own inducers uh, on our inducer population because we will not be able to color select uh, haploids. And so we were kind of using uh, the property that the R and J gene is uh, suppressed by the C gene. They are both in the same pathway. So it's kind of a complementary uh, approach if you want. Um, so if you have an inducer uh, that is not carrying the, R, the C gene, uh, then you can induce uh, our uh, inducer population that has the R gene fixed. And uh, in this case, you would not, like with the regular process, identify uh, haploids by being colorless in the embryo, but uh, just the other way around, um, the haploids would now be colored. Yes. Now, I, I think uh, combine your explanation with you now understand that the donor column, the inducer column, it's all the germplasm pool within inducer you try to do. So this is all research. Okay, that's very clear now. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? Uh, you rule on the slide number 12. Mm -hmm. So uh, you on in, for each inducer you have a HR rate, right? HIR, high mm -hmm. induction rate. Yes. Are those uh, estimate of induction rate being updated uh, after you know every five, six, ten years? Or it was inducer uh, haploid inducer rate that was estimated uh, at different time of you know long time ago, some recent. Uh, it's a general question. The numbers is being updated, or is the number that recorded during that time that inducer was heavily used? Uh, okay, so those number is based on the literature review. I, I just write the number uh, to 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 arrange they into a pedigree matter show up here. So they 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 they, they are they didn't to estimate their haploid induction rate nowadays. But I think um, they are quite 
they, they were not changing a lot because we, because breeder uh, make a big progress on those lines to be modern haploid inducers. So, so the inducer close to, to 2020, that will be have higher induction rate in the end. So I think- so I, I, I can accept uh, your, your, your estimate saying that they're roughly stay the same, but what do you think going to the future as mm -hmm. double haploid for, you know, technology is being used widely. And then mm -hmm. we typically like to work with germplasm that has a, a higher being induced. And then would the number will be naturally uh, gradually increasing, even if you keep using the same inducer, because now people are more, you know, uh -huh. prone to use the material that are easy to be induced. A hypothetical question, right? You only want to yeah. show your understanding. Yeah. Mm. It, it could be possible if the donor germ person enhance their uh, induced ability, even though the haploid inducer rate of the inducer is, is not improved a lot um, in, in the future. But I think in our, in, in my point of view, uh, if the breeding company have the higher induction rate inducer, will enhance, will have much uh, close down in their breeding pipeline. Yeah. Good, so. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe a comment. So I think it's it's a valid uh, point because I, I really believe there will be inadvertent um, selection for increased inducibility. So the ability mm -hmm. uh, on the donor side to be induced. Um, and so for that reason, we have uh, been using uh, like the same uh, test donor over the years in order to be able to compare uh, induction rates. If you're not doing that, um, also if you want to kind of market your inducer, uh, as there is variation uh, between donors in uh, inducibility, you can just pick inducers that have high induction rates on the female side and then uh, kind of market your inducer as uh, one with a high induction rate. So one has to be a little bit uh, critical about those uh, induction mm. rates. Good, thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't see any uh, questions. <laughs> and I have heard so much about inducers that I don't really have much questions myself. <laughs> um, I we can ask people to feel free to leave, but if people uh, still have like to discuss, learn more about uh, you know both topics, you can stay. Yeah. Hey, uh, Danny actually had to log off for an unavoidable meeting. He says, but he had a question comment. Um, he th thinks this was really exciting. This question is, what's next in the improvement of induction lines once we reach an optimal level for induction rate and balance that with seed production? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I think it's a big problem for haploid induction, haploid inducer development because when the induction rate increase, the, the performers of the seed set will increase. Some of them will maybe have the set effect, the germination rate, germination rate will decrease or, or, or their, their, their performers in the field may be not good enough for different environmental, especially, especially now uh, have a much tough environments in the field. So, so I think if you have, if you find a optimal <laughs> performance of the inducers in the field, when we said that the super, super, superior progeny, it, it should be concerned other trade like the lodging uh, tolerance or the, the, the tesla size, something like that. Yeah, so it, 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 uh, for, the, <laughs> for the high level haploid inducer, it, it cannot just consider just one trait. It should consider much more trait. 
when we in the system thinking. <laughs> yeah. So it's it it's a hard work. <laughs> Yeah, should we move on then to to just uh, invite whoever wants to stay around and um, uh, wants to have additional discussion with the two speakers. Um, so I think I will just both speakers for very nice uh, presentations and anyone who wants to log off, this is a good time and whoever is interested to stay on for a little while, uh, just stay on. Uh, yes, I'd like to see students that register a class to stay. If they have, if they haven't logged off yet, <laughs> I see Tadinda, Huang, at least Matthew, uh, uh, Matthias. Okay, Matt Carroll. Okay, Matt is going to ask a question. Matt Carroll, go ahead. Discussion. Um, so I had a question for for Laura, and and they kind of touched on it a little bit. But looking at like your uh, your false discovery rate or like your significance threshold, so you showed three. You, know, you had your, the traditional von Froni, your simple M, and then, like FDR. In your your own research and in your review for this paper, uh, has anybody really gone into you know like what method you know produces like it kind of optimizes like the spurious results you get with GWAS, but also like when you go in and find mapping, actually saying you know this is, you know, we find the most amount, you know, we, we utilize our resources the best as far as those different methodologies. And it's probably subjected to the trait and, you know, you know, population and size, but have you found any like kind of results on that? Yeah. So like you said, um, the fun part about GWAS is that there's no perfect method for every single trait um, because in terms of like not just significance threshold, but like MLM, ML, MM, lots of Ms, farm CPU. There's just this laundry list of methods that each make a little bit different assumptions about the traits genetic architecture. So it depends on how um, well that particular method fits your trait. So um, I guess I would say first is that if you do know more about your trait to try to find a method that kind of um, fits that with its assumptions um, and then as for thresholds um, 